Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, and I've got Jim Schlexer, uh, who was kind enough to send me his book, Professional Drinking. And um, uh, while I am a professional drinker, uh, this does not cover what I do professionally, but it covers what he does uh, in advising people on how to drink in a professional manner, which uh, I have to say, Jim, this is an awesome book. And uh, so let's get started, Jim. Um, you have a, a background in uh, being a CEO and uh, tech and all that. Why don't we kind of go with a little, little background of you and what you did before and how what you do now? Yeah, so I, I uh, I've been a CEO and run companies since I was a young guy, and uh, you know during that time I had an opportunity to ent entertain clients, um, really all around the planet with wine and spirits and so forth. And uh, most particularly in the current business that I own, which is the CEO advisory business, so I help other CEOs sort of elevate their game. I, you know, I'd see these really confident, capable people. I'd hand them a wine list, and they'd start, you know, flop sweating and handshaking. I'm like, this is crazy that these smart, capable people can't handle themselves around, you know, a dinner table with wine and spirits. And, and so I went looking for a book. They're like, there must be a book that talks about this, um, and um, there isn't one. Um, turns at, and sort of in the middle there, I did go and get my uh, sommelier certification. So I'm a certified sommelier as well. That was more just for fun. And I said, what an interesting combination of the business world that I've been in for 30 years, the sommelier, the sort of spirits and wines that we learn about there, put them together, and that this is the baby of that combination, basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, when I saw the email come through, you know, I saw what the book was about. I was like, this sounds like it might be a cool thing. Um, mm. And so I spent, you know, a couple of weeks uh, doing, uh, reading it at my day job and uh, on my breaks and my lunches. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, and it was, I think, a really, really good read. Um, so you talked about you have uh, the, it's your, your, your CEO uh, company is uh, Inc. CEO Project. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, I'll have a link to that uh, site if you want to check out what he does. Um, so you definitely check it out. You also wrote, this is like your second book, right? It is, yeah. It's, okay, so you have a uh, first book is called Great CEOs Are Lazy. I like that title. There you go. See right in the background. Great CEOs are lazy, <laughs> yeah. Which everybody says, well, I knew they were lazy, and son of a gun, you proved it. But <laughs> um, it actually uh, talks about how to be a little bit better CEO, how to use your time more effectively. And it's it's a lot of what we do teach the CEOs in in that particular part of the business is how to be a better CEO. So, yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've, I, I joked, um, I kind of brought up the whole professional drinking thing. And um, I've joked for a very long time that I'm a professional drinker. Um, and so, yeah, when I saw the title, I was like, I got to check this out. And like I said, this is definitely a book that isn't about being a professional in the beverage business and yeah. about how we imbibe and taste and evaluate. This is definitely something for your average person um, to really kind of, you know, uh, navigate the minefield of wine lists and other beverages when you're out there, right? Yep. And, you know, and I was, yeah, you know, I wasn't looking to make them a sommelier. I was looking to arm them with enough information that they feel comfortable and confident in that environment of, you know, being around a wine list and a sommelier and in a, you know, in a restaurant, which one day, you know, we're going to go back to restaurants, I promise. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, look, wine is fun. Hanging out with your friends is fun. You shouldn't be nervous. And so all I'm trying to do is make that an enjoyable environment for everybody who reads the book. Absolutely. Um, so you, you, you did the whole, the, the whole sommelier thing kind of like fun. Um, you did mention in the book that you were a waiter at one point. So did that kind of help you when you got to the certified stuff? Well, it did because there's three parts of the certified sommelier test. In fact, from certified, advanced, and then master sommelier, the, the test structurally is the same, three elements. And element one is theory. And I did, um, I went up another sort of wine certification process to do the theory because I'm not working in the restaurant right now. 
um, which is WSET, Wine and mm -hmm. Spirits Education Trust. It's more of a theoretical uh, approach, but it helped me bone up on my theory. Having said that, as a psalm, you still have to know sake and beer and spirits and cocktails, and they don't cover really any of that stuff in any depth. So you had to learn that on, on my own. Right. Um, the second part is tasting. And I was lucky enough to get in a tasting group with an advanced sommelier. And that's kind of how psalm work. It's a guild. You know, the more senior ones teach the more junior ones. And so I had a woman named Ellie Bechamel, and she held a tasting um, class for certified. People wanted to be certified every Tuesday. So I'd drive into D.C. and taste with Ellie. And we taste three reds, three whites. And I sometimes get a few of them right. And over time, learned how to taste and discriminate and, um, you know, be able to pass that part of it. And then there's service, as you indicated. And that is um, having been a waiter really, really helped on that because you learn how to move it along, answer questions with enough depth, but not like a whole paragraph. Right. And what I saw when I took the test is there were some people that probably had better theory than me, because really the service environment is a master sommelier and you're serving him or her and they're asking you questions constantly while you're doing it. Uh, where is that wine from? What year would you recommend? What will pair with my soul? I mean, while you're doing service, just like in a restaurant, right? Yeah. And if you hadn't done that before, their theory was on point, but they didn't keep it moving along like we do as waiters. So, yeah, being in service as a, through college, basically, massive help in getting through the certified uh, curriculum. Yeah. Obviously, I can tell you that. I mean, uh, I... I did my certified. I'm, I'm currently working on talking my advanced. Did not pass this Oof, year, unfortunately. Um, I yeah. was kind of close, but not close in certain things. But uh, even my mentor, uh, Craig Collins, he uh, he wasn't really ever in the restaurant side of things. He started out. He worked mm. at a winery, did distribution. He got into the master Psalm program um, that way. But he did. While he was studying, he was like, I kind of need to know how to carry a tray. And so he did that. He would like work on weekends to kind of get, you know, more comfortable with it. And yeah, you're right. It can be really stressful. The service side can be, for a lot of people, the most stressful part because you've got to multitask. It's not just a piece of paper in front of you. You make sure you get the right answer. The tasting can be, can be nerve wracking because you have the master psalms at the, yep. um, at the advanced level and higher. Um, that are sitting right in front of you writing notes and you got to wow. verbalize everything <laughs> and you don't want to, you don't want to say anything wrong. Um, I can say that for my test, it's, mm. of course, I don't know if I got the wines right, but when you, everyone talks and you kind of figure out what the wines probably were, I was probably, at least in my initials were probably of the six, probably five of them had the right initial in there. I may have had the right one, yep. about three of them. But they basically said, I just didn't describe the wines enough. So I missed yeah. out on points that I just couldn't. If I had just done that, if I had been more uh, descriptive, I probably would have passed tasting. I squeaked by on service more because my business sommelier section of my theory was really, really solid, except for the tasting part. Yeah. And then um, my theory itself was probably the, the worst part, which was a bummer because... Yeah. I, I thought my theory was pretty decent, but you know, hey, I got another yeah. at least 16, 18 months to, to study again because I won't be yeah. able to take the advance next year. They they canceled um, the exam for next year, except for the people that couldn't take it this year. But yeah, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know it what can I be got taught on tasting, but by, by Ellie was three in every category. Yeah, three fruits, three non-fruits. Th I mean, obviously, some wines are so non-apparent that you can't get three, but you're going for three in every one, right? And I always mm -hmm. had a couple of like backup generic ones like white flowers or right. <laughs> <laughs> white mushrooms or you could always pop that in there if you needed to. But um, but yeah, she said, you get three in every category, you'll get it. And and then obviously the structure calls are super critical. The acid, the tannin, the mm -hmm. body, the all that super critical. So yeah, yeah. they said, um, I'd say my structure was really good. Like that was, it good. was just really the, the palate, the palate and the nose. That was, I think, where I was lacking. And I definitely, there were some wines I struggled with. And like you said, you know, there should be some stuff in your back pocket. Not that you should be deciding what the wine is ahead of time, but if it's in there, it should be in there. And uh, one of the pieces of advice that I knew in advance who lives here in San Antonio had said is 
if you if you say a fruit, say the flower that's associated with it. Maybe not 100% of the time, but oh. especially like white wines, if you say orange, well, orange blossom. Well, there you go. You've got your, orange you got blossom. your <laughs> yeah. Two. Um, yeah. And I really good. struggle with, I struggle with floral so bad. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah. You always uh, hope for that wine that you, you bring it up to your nose and go, oh, I got it. I got yeah. a couple like that, like Gewürz Minor. I yes. hate Gewürz. And so the minute I smell it, I'm like, hey, I don't want to drink it, but I know exactly what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So. Yeah, there was a couple I was hoping I was going to get, and I didn't quite get those, but that's okay. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, and uh, my, my, my group meets every Monday morning. Um, nice. We were doing Zoom calls for quite a while, and uh, we finally are now meeting in person again. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's really critical. If, if you are someone that's watching this and are thinking about going into this side of things, especially if you want to go higher than the certified um, a tasting group is absolutely critical. I somehow, somehow, some way passed my certified without really being in a, a tasting group full time. So that's what really? this show well was done. actually wow. all about. This was my sti- my diary of my studies. And that's how the show started. Got so, um, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's awesome that you went through that. Um, and I think that really gives you a really good perspective of how things are because I think you can, you have both sides of the story, Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, not um, business side and the wine side, right? Yeah, but, but exactly. It, and it was it was awesome, but I'll I'll never do advanced like you're doing because I'm not in the industry. <laughs> yeah, so. it, it doesn't make sense. I mean, it, it you have it takes a lot of time, and you've got way more things to be doing than worrying about the 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 twenty some odd uh, premier crews that are now in Puy Fusé that now I have to make flashcards yeah, for. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that happened this year. Um, so yeah. anyway, I, I want to say, um, you know, I really like your writing style and, um, I think what was really nice about this book is that you really make it easy to understand for just the average person. Um, and I already, already alluded to that. I read this during my breaks and lunches and I find that, um, kind of after the fact, I kind of thought about it. These chapters are, you have larger sections, but you have like really small chapters in between. I'm wondering, was that just how it worked out? Is there your other book like that? Is it just like the CEO doesn't have a lot of time and can like digest like a small portion? Is that kind of one of the things with that? Well, I was trying to write a good bathroom book and uh, no, (laughs) (laughs) but it really is, you know, it's sort of that two to five pages a chapter. You could do one or two if you want to, or you could do more. But it was this, I think people like to read those bite-sized chunks. They're easy to remember. They're easier to read, like just like the way you read it. Look, I got five minutes, ten minutes. I can hit, do one chapter and then I can move on. And so I think, I think that's how people read nowadays. They like, I like shorter chapters. And so I went for that style because I think it enhanced the readability of it. And uh, the lo- the other book is longer chapters, more more te- not quite textbooky, but more in that direction. And I think it made it harder to read. If I was going to do a third book, which I might well do, it'll be shorter chapters because I just think people can get through that way easier. So, yeah, it was intentional. Um, and nice. I think it helped the readability. Yeah, I think it does, too. So um, you've actually mentioned uh, uh, one of your two rules that you have. You have another rule. Like ice cream, sex, and pizza, there is no bad wine. Um, and the wine is fun rule. I, th- I think in my, my opinion, that really kind of sets a tone for your book that you're not trying to make it a stuffy book. Um, and let's kind of talk about the no, the no bad wine, um, kind of yeah. maybe explain what you really mean by that. Yeah. So there's two elements to that. You know, one is a PQ price to quality mm-hmm. ratio. And so if I spend 10 bucks on a bottle, I'm going to get the experience that a $10 bottle of water, wine is going to give me. It's not going to be incredibly complex, probably not age worthy, a nice, simple drink now with my buddies at a picnic wine for 10 bucks. Awesome. That's a good wine. Now, a snooty you know, person might go, well, you know, the terroir is not well re- represented. And of course, you know, the tannins aren't completely in balance and blah. It was 10 bucks. That's not the point for that wine, right? Yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, if I spend 100 bucks, I go, all right, I want, you know, complexity and depth and ageability and and, in balance and elegance. And I want all that good stuff at 100, right? So you got to think about PQ of is it good wine? It's good for how much I spent. The second one is particularly in the restaurant where I spent a lot of the the book talking about being in a restaurant. and, And we both worked in restaurants. 
every dang bottle on that list was tasted by the sommelier. Mm -hmm. Every bottle, like not the one you're drinking, but like they know it's good wine. They know that's a good year. They know it's going to work with the food. They're, they're not going to intentionally put a clunker on their wine list because they're not going to sell it, which is obviously the business wine, a giant problem to have wine that doesn't move. So you could almost in a quality restaurant with a good wine list, just close your eyes and go, give me one of those. And you're probably going to be just fine. So, yeah. And I think I think people worry about it is like. That's the mistake they're worried about making. I'm going to pick a bad wine. And my answer is, there ain't any bad wine. Just get over it. Just pick it. You're going to be fine. There's no bad wine. And I think that just takes the energy level down one, and it makes it, you know, helps people. That was the goal. Yeah. When during my time in Morton's, you know, and I, you know I, the, mm. all, all my times before then, I was in like more casual dining restaurants, and you'd have maybe 10, 15 wines and not even like you even have like a wine list which is on your menu somewhere. Yeah. But when yeah, I actually got yeah. a wine book, you know, with four almost 400 wines on it, you know, it was a little bit of a learning curve for me. It was a little overwhelming, but once I kind of got settled in and I had a really good mentor at, for my GM at the time, yeah, you realize there weren't any bad wines on the list. Now, there might be a wine maybe that style you don't like, but that's fine. Somebody yeah. else is going to like that wine. Yeah, you're not going to have anything that's just bad nothing's going to be bad, you know? Right. So yeah, I, I, I really think that that was a really good point in the book that, you know, that there's, you got to look at that, that price to quality, you know, ratio because yeah, that $10 bottle of wine, it's not meant to be complex. I mean, you get, start spending no. some money. Yeah. You should, you should get some quality to it. It's like, you know, versus, you know, a, a, a $10,000 car versus a $50,000 car, you know? hundred percent. Yeah, yeah it's absolutely. Like your, your point about you may not like it. I, like I said, I don't like Gewurz particularly, mm -hmm. but I got a guy I taste with who would just every time I go, I'm not even gonna. He he takes it. He he loves the stuff. He'll drink yeah. all of mine and yours and everybody else's. He loves it. So there's a wine for everybody, and um, even if it's not for you, exactly. Um, mm -hmm. Early on in the book, you especially because you we're talking about being professional drinking. Um, you really talk about, um, uh, give us some good advice about being responsible with your drinking. Like, don't get drunk. I mean, if you want to get drunk at your house, I guess, but like when you're in those settings, uh, and you do kind of revisit that occasionally throughout the book. Uh, do you want to talk some more about that? I'm sure there's some stories yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, probably... <laughs> well, I think, I think judgment and competency in one area of your life, people tend to think crosses over to another period of your life. So if you're just making bad decisions about how much to drink and you get a little sloppy, people go, hmm, I wonder if he makes not the best decisions in business and I'm thinking about doing business with this person, right? So I think that's important that you potentially damage your reputation in business even though you go, no, no, that was just drinking, that's different. People don't think about it like that. So that's, and the other is if I'm gonna have a cogent business conversation with you at some point in the evening, I don't wanna, be, I'd like to remember it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> And I just, I don't want to be that guy that's just hammered. So I think you just need to pace yourself. I talk about sort of at my size and weight, I can metabolize, you know, sort of on the edge is two drinks for me. Um, but I metabolize about a drink an hour. Most of us do. Mm -hmm. So four hour dinner, I can have two plus three more, right? Because the first hour, I can have five drinks. And technically, I won't be hammered if I pace those out. I'd probably back that down a little bit. But you want to watch your consumption um, for me, I mix in water to try to help. And when I'm in a, a networking event and I'm not drinking wine, um, I'll usually do two techniques. One is the, the beer diaper. So you get a napkin around the bottom of your beer, right? And you, <laughs> you nurse the beer for as long as you need to to just be okay, right? But nobody knows how much beer is left or how much you drank or because the diaper is there. The other technique is a mixed drink. So I like uh, like bourbon and uh, ginger ale or rye and ginger ale. And uh, so the first one, I'll have normal strength. The second one, I might go to the bartender, hey, just pour it light, which they're more than happy to sell me ginger ale instead of bourbon, right? Right, yeah. And by the third or fourth, I'm just drinking ginger ale. But everybody thinks I'm hanging out with the crowd and I'm drinking, but I'm keeping my wits about me. So you know, if you want to get drunk, go out with your buddies, stay at home, whatever, don't, just don't do it in the business scenario. It's just not appropriate. Yeah, and and I think that's it should go without saying on my side of the industry, but it does happen. 
you know, that we get are surrounded by the product and we sometimes just take advantage of it too much. But no, that's a, it's a great it's a great point in the book. And uh, I'm, I'm really glad you had it in there. Um, yeah. So. One of the things about the book is that, um, and we've kind of already touched upon this, is you don't just focus on how to order wine in a restaurant, but you also cover like the etiquette as to what, how, what, the etiquette for what it comes to like being in a restaurant. You also cover like other environments, like saying at parties or at your house and stuff like that. You want to kind of talk about some of that stuff? Yeah. So I, I, uh, I talked to, I think I called it the, the service dance, right? Yeah. And I tend to was, think about it like that, right? And, and yeah, you know, the beverage waiter, service dance. Mm-hmm, yeah. Right. I, I approach the table. There's certain things that I'm going to say. Usually I'm going to end up with a cocktail order. I'm going to go get the cocktails. I'm going to come back and take the dinner orders. Like there's a pace of service that we all know as waiters and psalms. And and it behooves a, a, a diner to know kind of how that how the waiter is going to act because they have a role in this play. Like what, first thing you do is order. Co- then you're going to do this. Then you're going to do this. Here's when you should order the wine and so forth. And so I want to just lay that out of this is exactly what's going to happen from the waiter's point of view. So you know what you're supposed to do. But then I dig in a little more deeply on um, how do you actually order the wine? What do you do when the cork comes? What do you do when they give you that little pour? Um, This was some feedback I got from sommeliers when I was talking to them about writing the book. You know, there are people that, you know, they, they take a little sip and, you know, they're doing what we do when we taste. You know, they go, oh, I get white flowers and I get button mushrooms and I get orange and I get orange blossom and I get a hint of uh, petroleum and I get blah, blah. Like, no, <laughs> the only thing you're doing when you're tasting the wine is going good wine, bad wine. And the only way you do bad wine is it's corked. So I go, look, you go like this. You smell a wet dog, wet cardboard, wet basement. Nope serve it. <laughs> That's all you need to do. Yeah. And people, and people get really intimidated because they think they're supposed to pass some big judgment about the wine. No, just good or bad. That's it. Go. Yeah. I mean, when I was, when I was in the restaurants and I would serve the wine, you know, that, that's all, all I need to know is, is, is the wine clean? Is it, yep. or is it flawed? If it's flawed, I'll get you another bottle or maybe something different. But yeah, I, I have no, dog in this hunt i have no financial gain in this particular bottle of wine it doesn't matter to me you're not gonna hurt my feelings right. even if even if you're just gonna say i don't like it okay you don't like it uh you know what that means is an opportunity for my staff to learn about that wine you know we'll, we'll we'll cost it out we'll we'll take it out of inventory I'll, or my my vendor will will uh, replace the bottle for me at no cost we're not out anything i mean i'm not saying i want to do that with say a three thousand dollar bottle of wine but mm. You know, the, the point is, if the wine is bad, like it's flawed, or, I mean, not trying to encourage people ordering stuff just to try it, but if you don't like it, that's fine. We'll, we'll be happy to get you another bottle, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, I've only... I, I talk about this because I think people are intimidated to say a wine is corked. And we've all had corked wine. And I guarantee you people go, well, it's even if maybe they don't even know it's corked for one Mm -hmm. or it's mildly corked and they go, well, we'll just drink it. And they just don't think it's good wine. I think what they're worried about is how you might react as a way, a server or how, what's going to happen to the restaurant. Right. And I think the dirty secret, it's not, but nobody knows the restaurant doesn't get hurt. Just to your point, if it's bad, it's going back to the supplier and they'll replace it free. Nobody got hurt. If it's good, like you, you taste it as the psalm and go, no, it's not flawed. Either you do it for service to teach your staff about the wine, which is awesome, or it goes behind the bar and they mm-hmm. sell it by the glass. You'll make more money on that bottle than you did selling them the whole bottle. You'll sell it by the glass. So they'll, you don't lose if you send it back. There's no losers in this deal. And I, I think people to understand that, again, it takes the pressure off of, well, if I send it back, I'm, it's a bad thing. No, it just happens. It's part of the business, yeah. right? You know, and honestly, and I know it's not part of the book, but that extends to your meal. If there's something wrong with your food, send mm. it back. I've so many times I've in, in all the levels of industry that I've worked in, not so much at Morton's. Where I had people concerned, but, you know, people have watched movies and they're like, well, they're going to spit my food. <laughs> Trust me, they're not going to. I've, I've worked in a dozen probably restaurants, not quite. And I've never had a kitchen that would ever do that. Um, yeah. 
you know, while it's funny in the movies, it, it that is so rare in real life. And I know those are YouTube videos. People have done stupid stuff. But, yeah, yeah if your meal's wrong, something's wrong with your meal, send it back. We'll be happy to fix it. Yep. So, yeah, same thing with the wine. Particularly your server goes, I didn't cook it. I didn't right? make that <laughs> bottle of wine. So, right? mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, they, they, they don't really care. Um, you also talked about, um, like, being in other environments besides, say, a restaurant and how to kind of conduct yourself. Do you want to maybe talk about some of that? Yeah, well, one of them I talked about was wineries. Um, and, you know, it, it it's kind of a fun business trip where we maybe we work a bit and then we maybe we'll do a little wine tasting in the afternoon. That that happens if you're a Napa or wherever. And um, I think it's really key in a business environment to remember you're there to taste, not to drink, right? And so same deal. You get really – so you go to – two or three wineries and get six different wines, even if they're short pours, you are hammered. Like there's no yeah. getting around it. And so um, they'll have spit buckets in every winery. And you and I know if you're, taste, if you're tasting, you're spitting. If you're mm-hmm. drinking, you're swallowing. And so I encourage people to say, look, if I'm just going to a winery and I'm looking to find a wine I might like or two or three wines I want to buy, taste it, swish it, spit it. It's okay. Um, and I just want to discriminate between tasting and drinking. And it's very easy to get drunk and go into a couple of tastings and you don't think it. And all of a sudden you go to stand up and you go, whoa, what happened? Well, you had like six glasses of wine in the last two hours. Of course you're hammered, right? So yeah. Um, the other one I talk about is at home. Mm-hmm. And that's a real decision for me about bringing somebody into your home to entertain them. Some people are comfortable. Some people are not. You don't need to do it. But if you're comfortable – you know, you want to bring them into your home. You want to have an appropriate set of wine, a little bit of a, a bar if they're more of a, a spirits person. If you know the person well, like I know my friends, I know what they drink. Like I know he's a martini. I know he's a bourbon and water. I, I know what my friends drink. And so I could be ready for them from a bar point of view. But I did talk about, you know, the seven noble, having a basic wine cellar in terms of entertaining from home, the seven noble grapes, Right. And right. having a version of old wine, old world, and new world of each. And you got a nice wine cellar. 14 bottles. You got a nice little wine cellar. Somebody says, I want an old world red. Got it. I want a new world white. Red, white. Got it. You can serve almost anybody's palate with 14 bottles if you do it right. Yeah, I think that was a really good part of the book that you kind of said. Here's And yeah, you didn't go geeky. You didn't get like into like some unusual like diverse or something like that. You, you stuck with the, the major players. And if somebody wants to explore, that's awesome. But for just, if you're starting out, just to start with these grapes and know some, get some old and new world, and you're pretty much set. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we kind of talked about it uh, already about the, you know, the $10 versus $100. That, that was a really, that was a really good one I like. Also, like, you kind of give an overview of the world and what kind of wines to expect from, from those countries. Um, yeah. And then one thing I really liked, and I kind of wished, you know, even though, like I said, it's not geared towards somebody like me, um, since I ha- am a wine review show also, I used to score wines, and I, I admit, I pretty much was winging what, I, I had no idea how to score wine, uh-huh. and <laughs> and you have, like, a little breakdown, I know it's you're not the only one to, to do this, but I've seen this type of breakdown before, but it's great in here, because I think it also helps people understand how that wine got a 90 point, or an 88 point, or a 95 point uh, score, and um, and what they mean, and yeah. I think that was a really good uh, part of the book to really educate people because I know a lot of people are really focused on points, and I my 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 opinion on points is they're a good guideline. It's like right. movie critics. If you agree with the movie critic a lot, and he likes the want uh, the the movie, you'll like that movie. If he doesn't like it, you won't like it. But another movie critic you may not agree with, you may like the movie and they don't, or the other way around. So I think points... 100%. And yeah. I talk about about the parkerization of wines, right? Mm-hmm. Particularly New World wines. You know, Robert Parker, the famous critic, he had a certain profile, like big, bold. And so everybody kind of did that to their wine profile so that he would give them a good score. Well, what if I don't like that profile? What if I like a little, little more elegant, little... Well, I'm not going to like a highly rated... Parker wine, I'll like something else, right? I think the other thing that's important is, you know, um, what what I got taught is find a great estate in a great area that you like and drink that. And don't worry so much about the points, right? So I'll give you an example. Would you rather have an 86-point Chateau Lafitte Rothschild 
or a hundred point, you know, Lodi Zinvendel. And you go, I think I'd go with the 86 I'm... pointer. <laughs> right. Exactly. My point, right. You're like, yeah, I think I'm going to have the Lafitte, right? <laughs> exactly. I don't care what the points are. So, yeah. I mean, there's, like I said, certain producers, you know, you're going to get a good consistent quality out of them. Um, not to say that the wine will taste exactly the same every year, though there are wines that are like that. But, um, yeah, find some good producers and, and do that. You also kind of talked about um, kind of branching out, but, like, if you needed to order those Camuses and Silver Oaks to stay in a comfort zone, that's totally fine because there's, there's definitely going to be a consistency with that. But it's okay to start branching out and maybe, especially if the Psalm is going to give you some advice to – Hey, I don't want I don't want Camus or Silver Oak. There's nothing wrong with those wines if, if that's what you're going for. But if you're like, hey, I've had I drink that all the time. Is there something else that may be slightly different or similar? And maybe it's less expensive. Maybe it's yep. maybe there's a cool story to it. I mean, so I think you really touched upon that in the book too. Well, I, I think you know, and you know, you've done wine lists. They're like lifesaver wines on a wine list for the business guy. Yeah, because like, <laughs> right. We don't know wine so well, but I know Camus and I know Silver Oak and nobody's going to laugh at me if I buy a bottle of Silver Oak. So let me get the Silver Oak, right? And fine answer, lifesaver, like help, you know, give me the Silver Oak and you're good. Um, But what I think is an opportunity to look at what is the price point of the Silver Oak, Mm -hmm. buck and 25, 100, 100, whatever they're charging and go, all right, what else we got that's $125 a bottle? that would be maybe more interesting? And that's a great question to ask Assam, right? I mean, kind of that price range, what would be fun given what everybody's having for dinner that's at 125 a bottle or 100 or whatever the number you want to spend. So if you got to, go for the lifesavers. But I think it's just as much, maybe more fun to go, let me spend the same money, but try something I've never tried before. Yeah, I, I can tell you um, as being on, on the, the, the side of it, and I worked the more as I worked out, we were in a downtown area, so we mm. were heavily dependent on conventions. So we always mm. knew what conventions were in town, certain types of conventions. I knew I needed to stock up on certain of those lifesaver wines because that's what they yeah. were going to sell. And I mean, the reality is, did I have time um, to go to 50 some odd tables in a night and talk to each of these tables and try to find those really cool wines when I have a full house or? Is they, are they just going to order the Silver Oak because that's what they're familiar with? Yeah, and that's that is a time saver for me too. However, if you want to get go down a little rabbit hole, I'll be happy to do that with you. Um, right. But yeah, and from our point of view, yeah, certain restaurants are in certain parts of a, a town where you know you're going to have, you know, this week it's going to be the oil, an oil convention. Well, you're going to have a ton of Cab, Cabernet Sauvignon going out, and it's going to be like four or five different producers, so stock up on it because you're going to sell it anyway. It's not going to sit around. Yeah, yeah exactly. No, it's going to be a sla- slab in a cab, man. Big old slab steak and a, and a big old red. <laughs> Absolutely. It's definitely the thing in Texas for sure, even in the dead of summer because we have air conditioning, you know? So Yeah, um, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, We've kind of we've we've actually kind of talked about it, but I want to, to highlight again. Um, I really think it was great that you um, really went through and kind of like you said already, you kind of give the the reader an idea of what the restaurant's going through. Um, and we've touched upon it, like you know, if you send the bottle back, it's okay. We're we're not gonna we're not gonna be mad at you. We're gonna get our money back, or we're gonna we're gonna make money off of it. You know, and there's other things about the restaurant industry that you've you've kind of like secrets that are not really secrets, but you've you've really kind of made it known that this is what happens, and it's okay if you need to uh, order a certain way or however you want to you need to act or understand how to act in the restaurant. Yeah, I, you know, I, I as I got into this, I learned you know people say, "Wow, it's so expensive," but you start thinking about because a, 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 a restaurant will take the wholesale price and, you know, two to three times, depending mm-hmm. on the restaurant and what their markup is. And you go, well, I can go buy that at the wine store. Well, yeah, but they stored it, they inventoried it, they opened it, they got glassware, they got a, a SOM. They, I mean, there's a whole service thing that's wrapped around that costs money. And then the other one is wine by the glass, which I'm a fan of wine by the glass for a whole bunch of reasons. You know, you're going to take the bottle wholesale price and more or less that's the glass price, right? Cause you're only going to get four to six pours out mm-hmm. of that bottle, but, but it is a high margin offer wine by the glass. 
what I like about that is it features, it's an opportunity for the Somme to sort of feature their view on what the wine should be, get a little creative, maybe more than the list. Um, and again, from a lifesaver point of view, you can always go to a wine by the glass and buy the bottle. Yeah. That's a real, a lot of people don't think about it. They go, well, that's wine by the glass. No, you can buy it by the bottle. We're happy to sell that to you if you want it. And what's cool about it is, and, and you probably built these lists, you go for like good, non-offensive, never going to have a problem with it, wine on the wine by the glass. It, they're crowd pleasers, right? So if you're worried about, I'm going to pick a bad wine, just go wine by the glass, grab a bottle of that, and you will be just fine. Sam will take care of it. Or the GM, depends on the organization, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, you also have little like pro tips in the book, and we've kind of touched, uh, I think we've maybe kind of implied that type of stuff. Uh, tell me about the idea of having those little pro tips. Um, yeah, I wanted, again, it's a readability thing um, that, you know, if you just sort of glance through and you pick up the pro tips, there's 50 or 55 or 60 in there, um, you'll get some nice little nuggets that you can work with as a professional drinker. And, and one or two are stories like about Dom Perignon and a couple of other, uh, what proof means, which is just mm -hmm. fun to know. But it, it's... Um, you know, for example, um, one of the pro tips on pairing is what grows together goes together. So it's it rhymes, so it's simple. But what does yeah. it mean? Well, like I, I was talking about it in the book, I go to this Greek restaurant, a Jose Andre Greek restaurant here in D.C., and I don't drink Greek wines very often, the Certico and all those. But when I go there, I drink Greek wines because they crush with the food. It's a with perfect pairings, right? Um, when you go to an Italian place. Hey, kids, get a Chianti, get a Barolo, get a Barbara. I mean, get an Italian wine. It goes with the food. That's the whole idea. So it's designed to be simple, digestible, memorable. And if you only remembered the pro tips, you will have gotten something out of the book. So readability and just pulling out those nuggets, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the goes together, grows together. I mean, it's we use, the, we use that phrase. It's not just some kitschy phrase. We use this phrase in, in the industry. And yeah, yeah. I, when I when I go to a restaurant that has a certain style of food, I, I do my best to order wines from that country or that style. Um, I have been to some restaurants that you're like, cool, I'm going to have Italian food. I'm going to have Italian. Oh, it's all American wine. OK, well, that's <laughs> what I'm going to have. That's what I'm going to have. Total have like, on the wine list by whoever put it together, though. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but, you know, I, it, it, it has happened. Uh, rare mm. when I've gone to places like that, but yeah, that, that's definitely a rare event. Um, mm. And then um, we we kind of talked about this before we actually started all this. So one of the things I really really like is um, that this is a book that even though it's not targeted towards people like me, I think people like me can get value out of it. Um, especially mm. you have the the good psalm versus the bad psalm um, <laughs> uh, chapter, and um, yeah. I'm not saying I was ever perfect, but I was more on the good side for sure. But I think, you know, we have that, we have that um, reputation or that image that we're snooty and that we're going to look down on people and we're going to be difficult to deal with. And uh, yeah, they do exist, but th to me, they're such a, a small group of people, whereas the vast majority of us that are in this industry, regardless of whether we have a certification or not, we're here to help you out. And I think that was a really good chapter, but I do think that sometimes... You know, we have to, as a psalm, be reminded that we are here yeah. to take care of you, the guest, and not we're not being self-serving. You know. Yeah, it's hard though. We like, like even at my certified level, I know so much about wine, and I mean, I know more than any normal human being on the planet, right? And you know more than I do, right? It is really easy to get wrapped around the axle on all of that knowledge and be a little snooty in front of the well. You're using the wrong glass. Well, what the hell? Like, who yeah, cares, exactly. right? Really? Right? <laughs> so I think what I was trying to just, first of all, it goes back to, I used to read Highlights Magazine and they had Goofus and Gallant, which is, right? <laughs> That's good song, bad song. Basically, it's highlights in a wine book. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and I also want you to notice when somebody's not being a good song. That was the real thing I was going for. Because sometimes, like, like, let's say I say, hey, I think this wine might be corked. And I've had friends who've had this experience the, the, they'll go, that's not corked. Well, yeah. there be a, that's a bad psalm. You you need to understand as a consumer that that is inappropriate behavior on the part of a service 
personnel. They're supposed to help me and serve me, not tell me I'm a knucklehead because I don't know if it's corked or not, right? So I just I really want people to both the servers and the consumers to know what good behavior looked like. That was what I was going for. So, but if you see yourself in that bad psalm side, you may want to yeah, may want to yeah. uh, either get yourself on the good side or you, maybe you need to find another job. Yeah, yeah. I, and yeah, like the the corked wine thing we've, we've talked about a few times. You know, I've, I've had guests say the wine's corked, and I'll be like, and they're like. Why don't you try? It's like, no, no big deal. You say it's corked. I'll bring it to the back. We'll get you a new one. And I've gone at the back and I'm like, it's not corked. Um, right. right. And maybe, maybe, you know, cause corked is a specific thing. It might be something different, but it's still a bad wine or like, yeah, sometimes there's nothing wrong with the wine. It's just, it's something that they weren't used to. They weren't expecting. Maybe it was an aged wine and it was, it smelled old. You know, I, I, I yep. convinced them to get like a Grand Reserve or Rioja or something like that. That's like 10, 15 years of age. And they were expecting mm. like really nice, bright fruit and ripe, and it was all dusty and, and like, oh, well, okay, yeah. you know. So that's fine. As a psalm, we again, we shouldn't be, you know, uh, making our guests feel bad or feel stupid because of something. It's just like whatever you need, we'll take care of it. You know, I, I mean, I yeah. trust you that you are saying there's something wrong with the wine. No worries, I will okay. bring it to the back, and we'll get you another wine. You know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So anyway, I was just going after that. The good song, bad song. So yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, we definitely could talk about more about the book, but I definitely want people to go buy it. Um, and, Me too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I know, like when people do like these movie review interviews and, and book interviews, you're like, well, what else? Well, no, you got to read the book to get everything else. I think we covered most of the highlights. Is there anything that maybe you wanted to touch upon that we maybe didn't uh, talk about? Um. I'll give you one of the best pro tips in the book Okay. That, as a sort of a closer, but a teaser that there's more, right? Okay. Um, and that is when you go to a, um, a restaurant, you know, everybody knows what they want to spend, but they don't know what wine they want. And if you're with a group of people you don't know that well, like I'm with my buddies, they'll go, you know, hey, I'm spending a hundred bucks on, I mean, they'll just yell it out because they don't care, right? But if you're with business associates and you're trying to establish a relationship, you don't want to do that. So here's the technique. You take the wine list. The psalm is behind you or the general manager. You run your finger down the list. Now, you're not pointing at the wines. You're pointing at the prices. You stop at the price more or less you'd like to spend. And you go, I'm thinking about something in this region. What do you think? And any psalm worth their salt goes, well, yes, sir. I think we could certainly take care of that. What's everybody having for dinner? Blah, 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 blah. Let me go find something from that region that I think you'll really like. So it's a great way to communicate price and not embarrass yourself. And every psalm knows exactly. I'm sure you've had people do that to you. They point to the price and go, Absolutely. gotcha, no yeah. problem. Um, and, and on my end, if that person seems to be struggling trying to figure that out, I'll be like, I'll give us some suggestions. Well, I have a, I have a nice wine here and I'll, I'll run the yeah. line, my hand across. <laughs> like, here's price. that price. Yeah. I'll do like a low, mid, yeah. low, medium and high. Like here's, Hey, that Perfect. way that I'm asking you very discreetly, yep. what yep. do you want to spend? You know, oh, in my retail great. side, side of that same trick. Yeah. I in like my that. retail side, I'm, I'm a little more direct out though. Cause they'll, they'll say, I want something good. I'm like, okay. Um, and I'll ask a few questions, and then once I got the regions or the type of wine narrowed down, I'll say, "What price do you want to stay under?" You know. Yeah. Be- and um, and sometimes they they get a little not not defensive, but they get a little embarrassed, and they go, "Well, you know, nothing crazy." And I'm like, "Well, yeah, just kind of, you know." And I'll I'll put it usually it's twenty bucks, like under twenty bucks, yeah. And I'll say, you know, I had somebody, and this is an absolutely true story. It's probably maybe two months ago now. Someone was coming in. They were looking at some wine. And they kind of looked at some of my higher end wines, but I just did my usual, hey, how can I help you? We're looking for something really good. All right, uh, do you have a price wine standard? Yeah, nothing crazy, under 300. <laughs> okay, well, that's well, I the vast majority. That, sir. <laughs> <laughs> that's the vast majority of my wine is under $300. I probably only have maybe 30 wines, maybe 40 out of 4,000 that are over $300. So, yeah, it's not like. Um, yeah, so I, I tell that story to some people, and they go, "Oh, I want to, yeah, I want to drink with them too. I wanted, I wanted them to invite me over that night for, yeah. for dinner." So like we talked about it. You now, ninety percent of all wines consumed are under twenty dollars a bottle. Yeah. So, like when we're talking about three hundred bucks a bottle, 
we're in some rare air for wine. We really are. And so there is nothing wrong with a 20 buck bottle of wine. I mean, Not that's 90% of the market is that or under. So don't worry about it. It's good. Yeah. And you know, me working retail now and, and uh, I mean, I got a little spoiled and that's what happens when you work in the fine dining side. The reps are bringing in those wines you're selling for 80, 90, 100 bucks um, or more. And now I'm in retail, I was like, but people want that $20 wine. I'm like, okay. And I mean, the last year and a half, I've bought quite a few of those wines. So I know what they taste yeah. like. I, I may have had them 10, 10 years ago, eight years ago. And I don't remember what they taste like anymore. And I'm like, wow, you know what? There is absolutely awesome value for under 20 bucks. Uh, certain parts of the world are better values than others, but you, you're going to yeah. find good quality product. Again, we get back to that, you know, the price to quality ratio. You don't expect don't expect the bet don't expect like super complex wine for ten bucks, but it still should taste good. I mean, that's all we want, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, and, and I think you got to go to those up and coming areas when you want really good value. Mm -hmm. So you know you're really looking for good. You might go to Chile or Argentina or parts of New Zealand or parts of Australia that are not the common ones, right? And you'll get a better quality of wine dollar for dollar than you would if you go to Napa, for ex yeah. example, right? Yeah. So. My my current go to for for a really good. Uh, quality without really spending a ton of money is Paso Robles because you can get mm. something good for about 20 bucks on retail and I, that would probably be close to a 40-ish dollar bottle of wine out of Napa. And I explained to people it's yep. all about the real estate. It's just not as expensive to to grow and to harvest and to make the wine there. At some point, yeah. Paso will gotta, probably get expensive. And I there talked are some about wineries. that in the book, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. What, what, what's the difference between a 10 and a 100? And real estate is like the first thing I talk about, right? Mm -hmm. So It is. And, you know, I love, uh, like, this has been one of my go-tos. It's a uh, Cru Classe from Provence. Nice. Like 18 bucks a bottle. Rosé. Yeah. Delicious. All day long, right? Absolutely, man. Absolutely delicious. Well, Jim, um, I think we're probably at a good stopping point. Um, I do want to say I, I did go, when I went to your website, I watched one of those videos, watched like the first minute or two. So I just want to make sure that if you tackled climbing a mountain, playing soccer while drinking wine at the same time on a Saturday. <laughs> Not yet, but that's next. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we didn't cover that. But, uh, yeah, Jim plays soccer. He likes to climb mountains. Uh, and he likes drinking wine, not necessarily all at the same time. That was in the, the video. <laughs> and he, he exactly. takes Saturdays off. So yep. um, with that said, Jim, it's been a pleasure, absolute pleasure for you hanging out with me for uh, a while and talking about your book. Folks, uh, if, you are in the, in, if you're in a, a situation where you are entertaining, especially coming up hopefully in a few months when the pandemic, I know we didn't really talk about that, but when pandemic makes it, is goes away hopefully and we can go back to entertaining like we used to um this is an absolutely great book to pick up and read you know what even if you're not in that situation it's just a really good uh general education book on wine itself and how to order wine in a restaurant even if you're not trying to impress a ceo maybe you're trying to impress a date or you just want to know how to do it and not and, and feel comfortable about it so absolutely there'll be absolutely. links below in the description uh, to Amazon to buy this book and also Jim's other book. I also have links to uh, his website, his website and uh, his company. And I'm gonna that's Inc. CEO Project. And uh, right. yeah, and then, definitely. Uh, professionaldrinking.com is the is the other website to check out. I'll make sure so, to have yeah. that one too. Yeah. I, I you know and I, I think about this you know getting back to the restaurants. I go look, we're in the off season. Great time to go into training so we're ready when the season starts yeah, again. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Because, yeah, I mean, we, most of the country, you can still go into restaurants. Maybe it's lower capacity. I know there's a few places that are going back to the lockdown right now. This is, you know, we're recording this on the 21st of October. Um, but this is a perfect time to go out with your significant other or family or, you know, your, your household and sit outside, you know, follow all the uh, CDC guidelines. But, you know, you can definitely you know, use this and practice with it. It's still relevant now. All right, Jim. Nice. Uh, thank you very much. And folks, um, hope you liked everything here. Check everything out and we'll see everyone again next time.